Hi there, I'm Dr. McFerrin with DM Explains. In this video, I'm going to finish my discussion of the engineering design process in my attempt to introduce you to engineering design. The step we're going to pick up on is analyze and select. We should use an objective form, not just a gut feel. We need to actually use objective analysis whenever possible to make decisions. There are a number of different types of analysis that you can do, including functional, ergonomic, safety, economic, strength and failure analysis. All of these analyses may come into play in an engineering design project. In the real world, the type of analysis depends on the nature of the project. For example, if the project is intended for a consumer to use in their house, there's probably going to be an ergonomic analysis to determine, again, what are the effects of someone using it on a regular basis. There's going to be safety analysis. And then, of course, as a business, they're probably going to implement some form of economic analysis to see what profit they may make off of this product. In engineering school, on the other hand, it depends on what you know how to do. For example, it takes specialized knowledge learned over the course of earning an engineering degree to complete a strength and failure analysis or to complete heat dissipation analysis or a finite element analysis. These are all sorts of analyses that an engineer might do, but you have to have the education and background to do those. In the absence of any specialized knowledge, we should use our intuition. So what are each of these analyses? A functional analysis is, will the proposed solution accomplish the necessary functions? Ergonomic is, how will the people interact with the design? Safety is, will the proposed solutions be safe? Economic is, how much will somebody pay for the solution? Can we make money as a company? Strength and failure analysis is, will the solution meet our environmental demands? So let's imagine a team has done a number of different types of analysis on a bunch of different design solutions, and there's no clear best choice, or even if there is, how does the team pick the design to move forward with? The answer we're going to use is a decision matrix. So let's look at an example of selecting a solution. And this concept is for crushing cans. So let's take a look. I've got design idea number one, which is a spring-loaded can crusher. It has a foot-operated trigger, so imagine like a crossbow, you've got to pull this thing back and then you hit a, a foot trigger and it just launches off right on into the can. There's a crushing plate, which has a lower guide track and an upper guide bar to get the crushing plate to operate smoothly back and forth. Design idea two is a foot operated can crusher. Uh, you put the can underneath a plate. The plate has two guide tracks and uh, there's a spring that returns the crushing plate to the static up position. Design idea three involves having a gravity can crusher using potential energy. You've got two guide bars with a, a heavy plate. You use a pulley system to pull that heavy plate up and then you let it go to crush that can. You have to reload it by pulling out a cord. It's essentially a finger trigger. And the design idea four is an arm powered can crusher. There's a lever action which crushes the can. There's a single guide track for the crushing plate. And all you do is use manual power to lift and crush the can. What are some criteria we could use to evaluate these systems? Let's start with safety, ease of use, portability, durability, standard parts, and cost. Now, you could do actual analysis of this, but we don't have specialized knowledge, so instead what we should do is use our intuition. So let's start by rating each factor. And we're looking at pairwise comparisons, essentially deciding which idea is the best. I'm gonna use the number four to represent the best and the number one to represent the worst. So I'll make this matrix, which has my criteria on the left-hand side and my four different design ideas on essentially the x-axis. And so let's look at safety first. Which of these ideas do you think is the safest? Well, I think that the safest one is probably the arm-powered can crusher design idea four. The next safest is probably the foot-operated can crusher design idea two then maybe the spring-loaded can crusher, and then lastly, the gravity can crusher, because you really don't want to get your hand underneath that crushing plate. For ease of use, 
I would say that designs two and four are equally easy to use because there is relatively little muscle which goes into reloading the crushing plate. Whereas the gravity can crusher, you have to actually reload by pulling on a pulley. The spring-loaded one, you have to pull back like a crossbow. So I'm gonna rate both of those as four, and then I would say that the crossbow one is maybe, maybe the second easiest to use, and the gravity one is the least easy. I, th those could be interchangeable, but for the purpose of this example, that, let's say that's what it is. For portability, the least portable one sure seems like design idea three. I would go with design idea two because the way that it's drawn here, it sure looks like a, a larger contraption. Um, design idea one might be the second most portable. Again, I'm sort of just using intuition. If I were standing in front of a classroom right now, I would be asking for their opinions. And let's say that maybe Design Idea 4 is the most portable. As for durability, I think the ones that I'm most concerned about are the ones that are implementing hard crushing action in which things are smashing together. And so I would say that Design Ideas 1 and 3 are again the worst on durability. I think maybe the foot operated can crusher may be slightly more durable than the arm powered can crusher, but again, you may interchange these. As for standard parts, this is me going to a hardware store trying to find the stuff that I need. I think the easiest ones to find where I don't have to do a lot of extra machining, I can just pull stuff off the shelf, would be parts for design idea four, then three, then two, then one. And then lastly, cost. That's just a function of the materials that are used. The design idea four is probably the best. Design idea three is relatively low. There's not a lot of parts involved. And then de design idea one and design idea two are roughly the same. So in order to make a decision, what I do is I add up all of these ratings and the best one is the one with the highest rating. So design idea one comes in at 12 points. Design two at 16 points, design three at 10 points, and design four at 23 points. So it seems like design idea four is the best. There is, however, one problem with this. The problem is that all of these criteria have the exact same weight. Why is that a problem? Well, not all of the requirements are equally important. I would argue that some are more important. So. What we may do then is add value factors and use weighted decision making. So let's add some weights. Let's say safety is actually 30%. It is the most important thing. Ease of use and portability are also highly important. And the others come in at 10% each. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a weighted decision making matrix. We need to first rate our concepts. So what we'll do is we'll come up with a rating scale Here's an example rating scale for you. I'll make this little table with a score and the meaning. So a score of zero equates to not satisfactory, a score of one, barely applicable. A score of two is acceptable, a score of three is good, and a score of four is very good or ideal. Then what I'll do is I'll go through and I'll make ratings based on that rating system. Rather than ranking things against each other, what I'm doing is I'm just looking at each design in particular and saying, oh, this looks like it's pretty safe. In this case, design ideas four and two look pretty safe. And so I'll do that for each of the criteria, ease of use, portability, durability, standard parts, cost. And then in order to get the total, what I want to do is I want to multiply the weighting factor by the rating that I've given it and then add that up. So for the first column, design idea one, I've got one times 30 plus one times 20 plus one times 20 plus two times 10 plus two times 10 plus two times 10, which is 130. Similarly, using the same method, design two comes in at 280, design three comes in at 150, and design four comes in at 330. Overall, the decision is still clear that design four is the best, but the position of the others 
in their rank has changed. In fact, if I look back at what I had previously, I would have ranked them as four is the best, then two, then one, then three. But according to this weighted version, I would rank them as four, two, three, one. I use decision matrices all the time. I use them when I was trying to decide where to go to graduate school. The distance from where I went to undergrad was important because I was engaged at the time. Strength of program was an important factor. The ability to get funding was an important factor. And so I weighted all of these appropriately, made a decision matrix on Excel, and used that to help me make a decision after selecting a design concept, the solution must be tested to make sure it's going to work. Testing can take various forms. We can build the solution, see if it works. If it's something that's relatively inexpensive to prototype, that might be what we do. If we could build a scale model of the solution and predict if it will work based on the model. We could do an analytical or by hand model. In other words, use mathematics and see if it will work. Or we might build a model of the solution in a computer-aided design software such as SolidWorks or Inventor and have the computer predict if it will work. And that is one of the most common things that happens. So as a new engineering student or a person that is new to the concept of engineering, which one of these do you think is probably the least costly? Well, if I look at it, using an analytical model to predict if it will work, it just requires a pen and paper. And so that is obviously the cheapest first approximation of whether or not a solution will work. Once the testing is finished, the final solution can be built and delivered to the client. Let's talk a little bit about a model. A model is just a simplified version of reality. It helps us describe a design or system, and it's useful for communicating that design to other people, most notably the client. It helps us to understand and explain reality. It's useful for improving and optimizing a design. It also helps us predict future behavior. Will this design do what we expect it to do? Like I said, there are CAD models, physical models, analytical models, numerical and computer simulations. CAD, computer aided design, is typically a 3D representation of a design on a computer. There's things like Fusion 360, Inventor SolidWorks, SketchUp, AutoCAD, Creo, and so on. Sometimes a CAD model can be used as a starting place for a simulation, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit. We have different levels of physical prototypes. We have an appearance model, which depicts the appearance only and is not functional. We have a breadboard or testbed or proof of concept model. These are not fancy. They're intended only to be used to test the function of a system. They may, may represent only part of the entire product or system, and they're usually created using hand tools or simple power tools. Then we have what's called the alpha prototype. This is typically the first full-scale working prototype. Parts function like the final parts will, but may be made using different processes. In other words, you might make it in-house using CNC machining rather than something that's a larger process like injection molding. A beta prototype is parts that are made using the real production processes, but these may be made using different production systems. In other words, they may be hand assembled rather than using automated assembly. Analytical models are mathematical models of the system. It's an equation or systems of equations that predict future performance of a device or the system. The equations are solvable by a person in closed form, meaning you can actually get a solution for them. Often these models are very simplified compared to reality. Often these models are very simplified compared to reality, so they are just a starting point, a first approximation. Coming back to computer or numerical models, when the system of equations is too difficult to solve by hand, usually an engineer turns to a numerical solution. A computer can be programmed to find an approximate solution to the equations. The approximate solution can be made to be really accurate if you give it enough time. Two examples of computer or numerical methods are computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis, so CFD and FEA. Programs that you, we use to do this include things like MATLAB, Python, other coding, other coding softwares. There are also specific softwares for specific types of analysis like ANSYS. 
suggest to review the engineering design process as presented through this video and the previous video. First, we define the problem. Second, we generate multiple ideas. Third, we gather information. Fourth, we make a decision. And fifth, we test and implement. But I want to caution you that not all of these steps happen in order, and often they are repeated quite a few times throughout the process. Thanks for watching these two videos on the engineering design process. Bye for now.